are our inland seas, the Great Lakes, the lakes of their kind in the world. Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, Ontario, and these are the many fascinating and different cities that you will find bordering them. Many of them are world famous, like Buffalo, Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, Sault Ste. Marie, and Duluth. And between these famous ports are others which are quaint or which have great historical significance. It's fun to visit them, either by land or by water. And it can be done on the beautiful cruise ships, North American and South American. On the North American, we go from Buffalo to Cleveland and to Detroit, and then to Mackinac Island and on down to Chicago, Mackinac Island, up through the locks at Sault Ste. Marie, and then over into Georgia Bay to visit Midland, and then back to Buffalo. On the South American, we go from Buffalo to Cleveland to Detroit, then to Mackinac Island and up through the locks at Sault Ste. Marie to Munising along the pictured rocks, then to Houghton and Duluth, and back again through the locks, back to Detroit and Buffalo. We enjoy a different stop every day, as we shall show you in the pictures that are going to follow, which depict the happy cruise of the South American and Buffalo. We enjoy a different stop every day, as we shall show you in the pictures that are going to follow, which depict the happy cruise of the South American. Here we see it coming into Detroit on Sunday afternoon, docking at the foot of Woodward Avenue. It's always a busy time as this beautiful ship moves into the docks. The lines are thrown. The men who have been waiting for it bring them in and secure the ship. Then the gangplank is brought out, and all of this is watched by a large crowd that gathers, some of them going on the cruise, some of them just there to watch. When the gangplank has been put in place, some passengers will disembark, having ended the cruise, or perhaps they've taken a weekend cruise to Buffalo. Others are checking their reservations and selecting their dining room reservations. They are determining whether they'll take the first or second sitting. In the meantime, the bellboys are busily engaged in carrying your luggage to your staterooms. Then finally, the whistle blows and tells us that we're about to depart. The gangplank is brought back. The huge iron gates are slowly swung into place. And the ship backs out into the Detroit River. When that happens, a great rash of waving breaks out. The bellboys wave from the main entrance. The waitresses wave from their private deck. And the passengers throw serpentine and confetti, which has been provided them by the hostesses, at their friends on the dock, who have gathered to bid them bon voyage. And then the music strikes up, numbers like anchors away, and sailing down the river. And this adds so much to the spirit of the occasion. As we proceed up the Detroit River, we see many small cruisers and many interesting larger ships, like this one from Norway. We have a fine meal at supper time and then settle down on our deck to watch the magnificent sunset that we see as we cross Lake St. Clair. And the sunsets on the lakes are a very good reason why anyone should take a cruise. They are magnificent. In the evening at 9 o'clock, Miss Mary Lou McIntyre, the director of social activities, talks to the assembled crowd and then introduces Captain Spute, the master of the ship, a fine gentleman, very congenial one, and he bids us welcome. And then he introduces some of his ship's officers, Mr. Green, Mr. Griffith, and Mr. L, from the Stewards and Purser's Department. First thing in the morning, we find our ship gleaming and white, cutting through the deep blue waters along the northern part of Lake Huron. It's gleaming and white because it's an oil burner. There is no coal or soot or smoke to mar the pleasure of your trip. Right after breakfast, we're ready for our mile hike, led usually by the drummer or 
one of the hostesses. Nine times around the ship gives us one mile. On the first day out, some folks are a little bit bashful. They don't join in. But by the end of the cruise, they'll all be taking their morning constitutional. They are supposed to be going through their calisthenics. But you'll note that there are a few shirkers from this job. Here you will find people from all states in the Union and many from foreign countries. Some of these people come back year after year because they know that the routes are varied from season to season. Sometimes they'll cruise one summer on the North American and the next on the South American, but they're always back. After the morning hike, we enjoy a round of horse racing. It is amazing to see the spirit that goes into this game. The dice are rolled and the horses are moved according to the numbers that come up on the dice. And these people are just about as excited as if they were actually watching a real horse race. They were unaware of my photography here, and you'll see that they're becoming quite excited. Actually, if you play hard and well and win consistently, you may make as much as 50 cents or a dollar in one day. So you'll see that it is not a thing of great financial consequence. I wandered about looking for other scenes of interest on the ship, and it was not hard to find them. There is a fine sun deck, and you'll find it occupied constantly while we're on the warmer southern waters. As I walked about the ship on the first day, I found most of the people were just relaxing, and that is, of course, the joy of taking this cruise. You can relax completely. Where our ship is going first, that the first stop will be at Mackinac Island, the fairy land of the north. This island is one of the most beautiful spots in the United States and in Michigan. The ship slowly moves into the main dock, and as soon as we disembark, we find a long line of carriages, horses, on the main street. And we learn that on Mackinac Island, there are no automobiles permitted. You must get about in buggies, or on horseback, or on bicycle, or on foot. As we begin to explore this fascinating island, we see first the old fort, high on the bluff, overlooking the straits. This has been under the French, the British, and the American flags. And it is always considered the number one historic shrine in Michigan. In the gardens below the fort is the statue of Father Marquette, the Jesuit missionary who came in here long ago and established friendly relationships with the Indians. We look down from the fort over the town of Mackinac Island, a town made up largely of hotels, shops, and restaurants. Wandering about the fort, we see the old blockhouse, which is considered one of the most historic buildings and photogenic buildings in Michigan. And now we go for the carriage ride around the island. We don't actually go around the island, but we're out for about an hour and a half, going through deep woods and stopping at scenic spots of great interest. Here we are looking through the Arch Rock, the number one site on the island. Standing on the top of this great limestone arch, which rises about 150 feet above the waters of the Straits. We can look out to the north and south and see Michigan in either direction. There to the south, we see the southern peninsula and a huge freighter slowly crossing the Straits. To the north, we see the northern peninsula and again the deep blue waters of the Straits and below the beach, and there is a fine road that goes entirely around the island concealed in the woods. We go on in our carriage and now stop at Point Lookout. And here we look down over the Sugar Loaf Rock, which the Indians thought was the dwelling place of the Great Spirit when he lived on the island. The last main stop on this trip around the island is at Old Fort Holmes. This is a reconstruction and of great interest, particularly to the historian. The last stop actually on the carriage ride is at the Grand Hotel, the largest summer hotel in the world and having the longest porch in the world. If you walk this porch five times, you've gone a mile. 
Every carriage taking the ride around the island passes the Grand Hotel. And the carriages always stop here to give you a chance to look up at these great American flags, which add so much color to the view. And they give you a chance to look down into the formal gardens of the Grand Hotel, which are open to the public. The public is invited to come here, wander along these pathways, enjoy the flowers, or just sit back in these comfortable chairs and completely relax. And now we stop to see the great pool of the Grand Hotel, one of the most beautiful swimming pools in the world. The waters of the Straits of Man are in the background, but they're cold and the currents are treacherous. So it is wiser to swim here. Here is the slide for the youngsters on the shallow end. And on the deeper end, there are two diving boards, the low one, which you see here, and a higher one for the more expert divers. You will always find good diving going on here, fine exhibitions of swimming, because there is always an audience. And naturally, those who are going to dive are the good ones. And here is the audience, people from the hotel or from the ship, who have stopped by for an hour or two to relax in the sun. Well, finally, we must go back to our ship. We're about to depart for other ports. The music strikes up again, sailing down the river or sailing, sailing. And out we go into the Straits. We look back at the Grand Hotel and the public swimming beach, which is just below it, the boardwalk, and the old fort and town. A lovely sunset and night. Supper time, and in the evening at 9 o'clock, the orchestra gives us a half hour of semi-classical music. And very capably, they do it, too. Then that is followed by a show put on by members of the crew, many of whom are very talented and elected for that reason. The first number in the presentation is a selection on the Hammond organ by Miss Bess Monroe, Showboat. And then one of the waitresses, a student at Marygrove College in Detroit, does an acrobatic dance ending up on the grand piano. Then two more members of the crew, a waitress and a busboy, play Malaguena expertly. A dancing team, the Wilsons, entertain delightfully. Even though they're in rather cramped quarters, they showed a great deal of spirit and real dancing ability. And now a quartet singing the sad story of Little Nell, very humorously. Here is the old farmer, the father, and Little Nell, an athlete, by the way, from the University of Michigan, the culprit and the sheriff. They are singing this dirge, and they are attempting to keep in time as they do it. And those attempts brought more laughs than appreciation. Then we have the barbershop quartet. And while they may look and dress ridiculously sometimes, their music is excellent. For most of these young men are from college glee clubs. They get together after they board the ship, produce their own numbers, and the music is really something to hear. Now they're joined by the ladies of the chorus, and together they do produce quite a bit of monkey business. Well, after that's over, we go up on deck and have the thrill of watching moonlight over the lake. And that is something you will never forget. You just stand on the deck and watch that full moon. And that is really one of the glories to be seen on a cruise of the lakes. To the Keweenaw Peninsula. Here you will see the Keweenaw Waterway, which cuts completely across the peninsula. We're going to be moving up towards Houghton on the left and Hancock on the right. These are the twin copper cities of the North Country, cities that were once booming and thriving when much of the world's copper came from Michigan. 
We understand that they are going to begin to boom again because copper will once more be mined in this area. This is the town of Houghton. This is where the dock is at which we will put in now. And we're going to have about an hour and a half to the sights of this town. The town band is out to welcome us and apparently they expect us to toss them some coins for the canvas is well spread. There are people in this band all the way from six to sixty and it's a most interesting group and they play very well. Everyone in town who can get away comes down to see this ship as it comes into port. The main street is just a block from the docks and so we go there. We walk up one side and down the other. We find it's a very good place for shopping, particularly for sport goods. If you wish to take souvenirs to your friends, you'll find all kinds of them in the windows made of copper. Beautiful pieces. Many of them very inexpensive, but most attractive. After our brief visit at Houghton, the ship goes on its way again up the Keweenaw waterway. And this is truly one of the lovely parts of the entire cruise. The ship goes very slowly, and in about two more hours, we go through the narrows, which are man-made, and then finally past the breakwater and out on. Here we come to those deep, cold, dark blue waters, which are such a joy to those who have been in the North Country. And almost before we know it, we're arriving at Duluth, Minnesota that great metropolis in the North Country, the northern terminus of this cruise. There is that strange bridge, the only one like it. Everyone likes to get out to watch the bridge rise as our ship passes under it. Here are some of the largest grain elevators in the world. And here ahead of us is our dock. Beyond it, the city of Duluth, which as you can see is built right on the edge of a mountain. Now we can go by taxi or by bus up to the main street or we can walk. It's only a few blocks and you'll find wonderful stores for shopping. Sporting goods of all kinds may be found in these stores. It's a delightful experience. And after you've finished shopping, take the Skyline Drive. You may go by private taxi or there are buses which will take you here. You have a splendid view of the harbor one of the finest on the Great Lakes. And there is the road below us and our taxi waiting for us. The city of Duluth spread out far into the distance. Here again is the harbor and the South American you can see just in the center of the picture. There is a stop here of several hours. And then we go back to the flame, which is always recommended to passengers of the South American for a wonderful luncheon. It is right close to the ship and is highly recommended by everyone who has been there. Late in the afternoon, we put out again. We cruise along the rocky shoreline of Lake Superior and again thrill at one of the spectacular sunsets that we always see on these cruises. First thing in the morning, Miss Monroe, with her drum, leads us on another mile hike. But you will notice that the people are more warmly dressed now because we're on Lake Superior and it is cold on the lake. Anyone taking this cruise should be sure to take warm clothing. Take several kinds of jackets. Now we're going to have a detour. We're going up onto the sun deck, around that, and then down on the other side just to add a little variety to the morning hike. We'll find now that so many people have gotten into the swing of things that practically everyone on shipboard is taking the hike. That's the way to enjoy a cruise anyway. Get into all of the activities. You'll make friends as a result who will last for years. Now we've crossed Lake Superior again and we're nearing the locks at Sault Ste. Marie. The greatest steel mill in Canada was shown at the left we go slowly and now are approaching the Canadian lock. Right ahead is the lock itself, which is like a great box of cement. We're going to move into it. 
and then the gates will close behind us. We are about 21 feet above the waters of Lake Huron now, and we must be lowered. Everyone is out to watch, because this is one of the most interesting activities of the entire way down. Actually, it takes from nine to 10 minutes for the entire operation, that is the lowering of the water. Now the gates, the lower gates, slowly open, and we can sail out onto the waters of the St. Mary's River, waters which are 21 feet below the level of Lake Superior. Now we're moving slowly into the lock, and as I photographed out again over the back of the ship, we see the lock from which we are passing into the waters of Lake Huron. Now the lock will remain that way until another ship wishes to go up. We just rest for the rest of the cruise now until we pass under the Blue Water Bridge at Port Huron. And we know it will not be too long before we are in the St. Clair River Flats, where once more we will see many interesting types of small boats foreign boats and large freighters, well-known places like the old club, and the many summer resorts of the Flats area. This is one of the most delightful places in Michigan for a vacation for those who love the water. And then out onto Lake St. Clair, we cross that quickly, and then come on down the Detroit River. Here we see Windsor, Ontario in the background. We stop briefly at Detroit, and then you on down the river, looking back at Detroit's skyline as we do so. Now we have passed under the Ambassador Bridge. Then out into Lake Erie, and on to Buffalo. In the morning we dock below, and before very long, we are out at one of the great wonders of the world, Niagara Falls. It makes no difference how many times you visit here. Niagara Falls are always an inspiration and a joy to behold. At the moment, we are looking at the brink of the Canadian or Horseshoe Falls, which we are photographing for the moment in slow motion and using telephoto lenses. And now we look across at the American Falls, below which we see the Maid of the Mist. The Cave of the Winds is in the center of the picture now. There's the Maid of the Mist, making her way up against that furious current, but giving you an unsurpassed view of the falls. We have luncheon where we can see the falls as a wonderful backdrop. And then we go on down the river and Watch the Whirlpool Rapids, which to many are just as thrilling as the views of the falls. There's a furious current here, and the waters are as deep as those cliffs in the background are high. No one could swim these waters. Waves, some of them, are as much as 15 feet high. And strangely, they are always there in the same positions. You can go back year after year, and you will always find the main wave just as you see it in the picture here. The Whirlpool Rapids below the falls are always a delight to see. This is the aerial car. It moves out slowly on cables and will take you completely across the gorge above the Whirlpool. Delightful ride, not at all scary as it might appear to be. And now we're going to cross to the American side of the falls and board the Maid of the Mist. And this is, of course, one of the great thrills at Niagara Falls. You're dressed completely in rubber outfits supplied by the ship. And here we're moving right under the American Falls so that we can get close pictures 
of the catwalks at the Cave of the Winds. There we see them. And there are people walking about on those walks. The force of the water and wind almost takes your breath away sometimes, but it's a thrill you won't find in very many places in this country. We go up finally to the Canadian Falls and then back again to the original dock from which we took off. And now we'll stand right under the American Falls. This is one of the great thrills of going to Niagara, to look up at this great falls and just listen to the music that it plays for you. Finally, back to the ship and on our way now to Cleveland and Detroit. We're coming close to the end of our seven days cruise now. We've been at a different port every day. We've met many interesting people. We've engaged in all kinds of joyful activities. It's been relaxing. It's given us new horizons. And as the crowd disembarks, you'll find many old friends saying goodbye and saying that they're going to be back again the next year. This is a very busy time for the bellboys. And they do a remarkable job of bringing the baggage off, stacking it all up in good order so that it's really quite easy to find your own. And they'll get you to your taxi or to your car in short order. This is all a part of the fun of a cruise. This activity which goes on at every port. The people, the sounds, the calls, the laughs, all add so much to the joy that you have on such occasions. And now the music starts up again, sailing or anchors away, and the ship is about to depart once more. Again, the serpentine and confetti are thrown. Again, the last calls. Again, the strains of that music as we wave at our friends back on the docks, most of whom are saying that next year they're going on this cruise too. Those are the thoughts, the very happy thoughts that we have as we sail away once more on a wonder cruise of the Great Lakes on the SS South American.